With the time of convening having arrived, will all members please take their seats and cease audible conversation. I'll call this meeting of the External Relations Committee to order, and as we get started, I'd ask for a moment of silence for uh, it departed Atlanta Mayor Sam Massell. Thank you. I'll now recognize uh, Melissa Mullinax for some points of order before we proceed on our agenda. Thank you, Chairman Ash. Uh, is, it, is this on? Okay, it says red. So thank you for that uh, moment of silence for the, for the mayor. I was, uh, we, we had a trip to Washington last week and Jim Durrett was supposed to join us and he, he was not able to come because of, of Sam's passing and the funeral. And I was thinking about uh, a book I had read on Lyndon Johnson, and he said that when the burdens of the presidency got too much, he was relieved because it could always be worse. He could have been a mayor. So, um, you know, being a mayor is a hard job, uh, and Mart is where we are in part because of the strong mayors we've had in Atlanta. So, um, the last thing I want to say before we jump into the agenda is that the Writers Advisory Council applications are still open until April 1st. We have uh, some applications, but really could use board support in getting more folks uh, to consider serving in that capacity. Um, it's on the MARTA website, so just send folks who are interested to itsmarta.com and they'll see the application and all the information. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is approval of the February 17, 2022 External Relations Committee minute, uh, meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? So move, Mr. Chair. I, I hear a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, all, uh, everyone will please vote. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is a briefing of media impressions from November 2021 through February 2022. Ms. Fisher, please. Good morning, Chairman Ash, Vice Chair Scott, Mr. Greenwood, Ms. Mullinax, and committee members. It's a pleasure to come before you this morning to provide an overview of our media impressions for November 2021 through February 2022. Next slide, please. In November, the Indian Creek groundbreaking ceremony and press conference that we had received the most news coverage. We issued 10 press releases and were mentioned 556 times in news stories throughout the month and that added up to a $7 million advertising value equivalent. 76% of the news coverage in November registered as positive or neutral in tone. The high amount of negative news coverage that we saw in November came from the announcement of our upcoming bus service modifications due to a bus operator shortage. Next slide. In December, we issued 14 press releases, busy month, including one inviting our customers to tour the MARTA holiday bus at a holiday fair and tree lighting at Colony Square in Midtown. MARTA was mentioned 545 times in news stories and that equaled eight and a half million dollars in advertising revenue. The story that received the most news coverage in December was our announcement of the first transaction under the Greater Atlanta TOD Affordable Housing Preservation Fund the fund bought some property where the old GE factory near West End is, and they're going to turn that into affordable housing. The majority of the news coverage in December was positive or neutral, only a small amount registered as negative. Next slide, please. In January, we experienced incredible highs and devastating lows. The State of MARTA event garnered the most news coverage. The design of our new rail cars and the unique superhero video featuring the Georgia Delegation Transit Force received rave reviews. The loss of our general manager and CEO just days later was widely reported on, with most stories including important suicide prevention language and information. We sent out 16 press releases in January. MARTA was mentioned over 1,400 times, leading to a larger than average advertising value equivalent. Almost all of the coverage in the month was positive or neutral. We did have a 9% negative news coverage and that came from an incident at Vine City early in January where a trespasser was injured. Next slide. The launch of our on-demand transit pilot program, MARTA Reach, received the most news coverage in February. 
We issued 19 press releases leading to 740 mentions and another large advertising value equivalent. These large AVEs that we saw in January and February that are in the $30 million range, we don't normally see that because in those two months, bigger news outlets and industry publications that don't cover us day to day covered things like our new rail cars or the Marta Reach launch. The discussions surrounding transit investment in the Campbellton corridor received negative news coverage, although most of the news coverage in the month was positive or neutral. Next slide, please. Our media partners were instrumental over the last four months in spreading the word about our events, our services, our projects, including the recent track replacement work south of Dunwoody Station. Thank you for your time this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Fisher. The next item on the agenda is a briefing on the APTA Legislative Conference highlights. Ms. Kiernan, please. Good morning, Chairman Ash, Mr. Greenwood, Ms. Melanax. I'm pleased to be with you today to report on a very successful and memorable week we had in Washington, D.C. last week. And thanks to Ms. Hardage and Mr. Frierson for joining us for the duration. We also had Mr. Mullis with us briefly. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the highlights of our week. Um, I'm going to talk about the APTA Legislative Conference, um, our meeting with the FTA Administrator and USDOT officials, uh, Mr. Greenwood's testimony at the Senate Banking Committee hearing, and summary of our Georgia delegation meetings that we had. Next slide, please. The APTA Legislative Conference is an annual event that I guess we haven't done in a couple of years due to the pandemic, but we were pleased to listen to remarks from both Secretary Buttigieg and um, Administrator Fernandez and some of her staff. Um, what I really wanted to talk about on this slide is the alignment with this administration's priorities and what MARTA's capital program is seeking to do. Um, the, in particular, the focus from this administration is on equity, climate and workforce. And I particularly want to underscore the equity piece um, because what Secretary Buttigieg said in his remarks were, was focused on saving minutes and miles. And that's something that I think resonated with both myself and Mr. Greenwood. Um, and that's really what our expansion program is seeking to do. Um, the administration is also looking to invest in under-invested communities, um, provide access to jobs, and affordable housing, which is another strong alignment that MARTA really shines on. Next slide, please. On Tuesday, Mr. Greenwood was invited by our two senators who happened to serve on the Senate Banking Committee to testify to talk about the bipartisan infrastructure law's impact on delivering for transit. And uh, Mr. Greenwood testified and shared some of the bipartisan infrastructure laws highlights with regard to the MARTA expansion program, which I'll direct your attention. You have the booklet that we made for our trip on that highlights our six or so near-term federal funding priorities. Um, so Mr. Greenwood highlighted the Clayton Southlake BRT, the Campbellton Corridor, our electric buses, and the Five Point Station renovation. Next slide, please. We were also able to thank, uh, right before our visit, the Senate passed in final the FY22 appropriations bill, which included three earmarks for MARTA, which I think is perhaps unprecedented among transit agencies across the country. Um, so we were able to thank our superheroes for those earmarks. Um, in particular, Senator John It's Electric Ossoff um, had a $3.8 million earmarked to support our purchase of additional electric buses to begin to really transition our fleet to clean. Next slide, please. Congressman Hank Johnson, we talked a, a lot about DeKalb County and the projects that we have going there. Um, the request that he had made was $5 million for the Stonecrest Transit Hub, which unfortunately was made as part of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee requests and so didn't make it to the final bill, but um, as the congressionally directed spending requests open up again, we will work with his office to, to try again. But we were able to thank him for his general support um, of transit in, in DeKalb County and beyond. Next slide, please. Congresswoman Lucy, 
BRT Lucy McMath um, was able to secure $1 million earmark for the station rehabilitation at Brookhaven Station. And apparently we were the first of her constituents in her office after the pandemic and it was great to get to see her briefly. Next slide. We got to visit with Senator uh, Reverend Raphael Small Starts Warnock. The change that he was able to secure in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which increased the eligibility for sm the Small Starts program to a maximum of $400 million, which is meaningful for MARTA because many of our expansion programs are kind of right on that $300 million marker, and that was the, the prior limit under the FAST Act. So the expansion of the program will allow us to have more projects that go through the Small Starts program. Additionally, Senator Warnock was able to secure $5 million earmark to support the Clayton Operations and Maintenance Facility. And then subsequently, um, Secretary Buttigieg on Monday announced the Bus and Bus Facilities Grant Awards for this cycle, and MARTA secured $15 million for that same facility, which was the largest award made in the country. And I, I will note that now that the federal support for that project is up to $33 million, which by my calculations is the most a transit anything has secured since the streetcar, the city of Atlanta streetcar tiger grant in 2010. So congratulations, it was just really good news for Marta. Next slide. And finally, we got to see um, Congressman David Southern Crescent Scott and update him on all of the projects that we have going in Clayton and share the good news. Um, the O&M facility is not in his district, but it is close, and um, he continues to support the Justice Center Transit Hub. Do everything he can to support MARTA. So with that, I'll go to the next slide, and happy to answer any questions. But thank you, we had a spectacular visit and everyone's participation was very welcome and glad we were able to share that time together. Thank you, Ms. Karen. And questions from anyone? I would just like to acknowledge and, and thank the staff for including ATU uh, in that visit. I think that sends a, a powerful signal about where we are as an agency. So thank you for that. Thanks. Is there any more business to come before the External Relations Committee before I turn the gavel over? The External Relations Committee is hereby adjourned. Thank you.
Good morning. I would like to call to order the audit committee of the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. Today is Thursday, March 24th, 2022. Can I have approval for the November 19th, 2021 audit committee meeting minutes? Can we have a, f we have a um, second and a move. Uh, can you please vote? I don't see how Mr. Ash could vote. He's not here, but it did. I think it might be that I voted and I think I might be Mr. Ash. I think that's what's happened. <laughs> yes, I'm listed as Mr. Ash. That's what the problem is. You, I can make it. Thank you. Okay. And. So for the record, I voted yes, but Mr. Ash didn't vote. Can we correct that, please? Okay. Okay, the minutes are approved. The first item on the agenda is a resolution authorizing the award of a contract for the procurement of the annual financial audit reports for fiscal years 23 through 27. Emil Zanoff is going to give us a report. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Greenwood, members of the MARTA Board, uh, good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure today to present the uh, proposal to approve the resolution authorizing the procurement of services for our annual financial audit. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to give you a little bit of context and background, Section 16C of the MARTA Act requires the Board to appoint an external audit firm to conduct the MARTA external audits uh, of their financial statements and a single audit for every fiscal year. Our existing contract with Crow LLP is entering into its final contract year, which will cover MARTA's current fiscal year. So the audit work they will do over the summertime is, is the last in their existing contract. Crow has been MARTA's external audit firm for the past four years, and they're getting into, the, into their fifth year. They've been doing a great job providing uh, external audits. All of their audit work, as you all know, uh, has been provided on time with high level of quality. They've been doing our financial statement audits. They've been providing us with our single audit, with our NTD FTA report review, uh, the agreed upon, upon procedures. In addition to that, they've been provided, uh, providing MARTA with evaluated services most notably with a uh, very in-depth overview of upcoming new audit pronouncements. They've been presenting those to the MARTA board as well as to MARTA management, trying to help us be better prepared for what's coming down the pike in terms of audit requirements and how those audit requirements will impact MARTA. In addition, they've been providing MARTA with process improvement recommendations. Next slide, please. So coming up to this new procurement, we are at the end of, of the contract year. We need to appoint uh, uh, or have a new contract for audit services. We issued an RFP on, October, on November 23rd, 2021. Four accounting firms uh, presented their proposals in alphabetical orders. Those were Cherry Beckert, Crow, the existing audit firm, Molden and Jenkins, and RSM US. The source evaluation committee reviewed all four proposals. We looked at their experience in transit and government with organizations of similar size. We looked at their technical capacity to provide the audit services. We look at the experience of the audit team actually who will be providing the services. We looked at their DM, D, uh, DBA participation, a DBE participation uh, uh, proposal. We looked at their financial proposal as well. 
Uh, upon review of all those factors, uh, the Source Evaluation Committee unanimously scored and agreed that uh, we would recommend to the board to appoint or reappoint, in this case, Crow LLP as Marta's external audit firm for a term of three years plus two option years for a total of five years. The contract amount is $981,000. The DBE goal was set at 20% and Crow proposed to include uh, a woman minority owned firm called Bamford Brown and Associates, which is their existing DBE firm to continue to support Marta in their external audit services. They met the, the minimum 20% goal and I know they're using Bamford Brown because I have personally worked with their auditors, which are top notch auditors uh, as well. Uh, so I know for a fact that they're not just putting a proposal there, they're actually using accountants from, from that DBE firm because uh, I have personally worked with them. The amount, when we looked at the amount of the proposal and we looked at the proposed audit hours, came out to be the lowest amount per audit hour that they proposed uh, for MARTA. Their proposal is consistent it's slightly less than what they proposed five years ago. Uh, so I feel very confident that Marta is getting the best value for, for the buck, not just in terms of the proficiency of the audit firm. Crow has probably the largest market share as it relates to auditing transit properties in the United States. Uh, the, the audit team has a lot of experience auditing not just Marta, but other transit properties, uh, but also in terms of the financials of the proposal on audit hour, by far, you know, the, the most advantageous. So with that, um, I would respectfully request approval. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Yes. Do we have a second? I have a Miss Scott moved. Is there any discussion? Any questions? Mr. Mullis? Yes. Um, I'm looking on your presentation um, and looking at the scoring, and then I reviewed the price breakdown. Can you help me understand? Um, the price breakdown and the scoring? So I would go by memory lane a little bit, but uh, the price breakdown, uh, can we go back one slide? If we look at the absolute dollar amount of the price proposals, this is the second lowest proposal. The lowest was by another proponent, um, and it was approximately 20% lower. That proponent um, in their proposal included 670, uh, uh, 670 audit hours to be devoted to MARTA, whereas Crow proposed a little over 1,200 audit hours. So the proponent who gave us 20% lower price, A, proposed a number of audit hours, which to me, given their lack of experience with MARTA and much uh, lower experience in transit, would not provide the required level of service to MARTA uh, and will put MARTA at significant risk at the end of the year. Uh, but also when you divide the audit hours or, or the amount of dollars per audit hour, we still come way ahead in terms of um, the dollars per average audit hour that MARTA will receive. Again, there is no way in my professional opinion that a new auditor or an existing auditor will come here and do an audit of the authority, a single audit, et cetera, with 670 audit hours. So um, I hope that helps. Yeah, um, and, and then, um, then the firm that you're referring to, I, since we didn't say who it was, is Malden and Jenkins. Malkin and Jenkins, correct. Which is a local Georgia-based auditing firm and has done a lot of municipality works across the state of Georgia. Um, help me understand the scoring. So the scoring is based on, we have a technical component of the scoring and we have the financial component of the scoring. The scoring is administered um, by the 
Office of the Contracts and Procurement, they're sort of project managing and recording the scoring. What the Source Evaluation Committee does is we look at the proposal without the pricing first. So we look at the proposal uh, uh, exclusively on their capacity to perform the audit work and their experience. And we score capacity to audit, audit experience, DBE participation, obviously, to make sure that their, their heads are in the right place from a, DMB point, uh, a DBE point of view. And then, we score, and then we also look at their financial uh, capacity to make sure the, business, uh, the, the company will stay in business for the duration of the contract. Um, the Source Evaluation Committee, which consists of far, five MARTA executives, and I can name those if, if you'd like, go through that and then assign a score to these components. Like things like the financial, uh, their financial statements are pass and fail, for example. The DBEs pass and fail, but we score actually uh, Sorry, the, the experience of the audit team that will serve MARTA as well as the experience of the firm. Um, so we do that scoring and we're blind at that point in time to what the pricing is. At the end, we collect those scores. I don't know what, for example, Raj has provided as a score, so I score this blindly. He scores the, 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 the proposals blindly as well without knowing what I'm scoring. The contracts uh, and procurement office collects my score and the rest of the scores and then compiles an average technical score. At that final meeting, we look at the average technical score and then we look at the score based on their financial proposal as well because we don't want to be biased based on the pricing uh, as to how we score the technical capacity. We aggregate those scores and we have a composite score based on the weights of the score and then that's the final score that um, is arrived at. Matt, Madam Chair, may I ask one more question? Uh, Certainly. In, in your presentation, you have the pricing breakdown for all five firms, but you don't have the scoring breakdown for all five firms. Is there, is there a reason for that? I think we follow the typical customary template for presenting the um, procurement resolutions. Uh, I can't say that there is any specific reason not to have the actual numerical scores. When we reviewed it at the committee level, we did not ask him to bring that here. Is there any any additional questions? Yeah. Mr. Pond. Neil, I, I support this uh, recommendation. I'm going to vote uh, for this uh, selection. Uh, I think in the future, and I, I do not think we need to get down in too much detail as scoring for each individual firms, but it would have been helpful to have had maybe a template showing here are the six categories or in the waiting for those categories without going into the detail of the scoring. It would give us insights into say price might have been 20 percent of the scoring where these other categories would be different percentages i think you understand what i'm saying yes thank you any additional questions yeah madam chair yes mr farson yeah uh, i want to say that I, I do support this uh resolution also the um, crow has been uh, for those of us have met in these meetings these detailed <coughs> meetings on these audits that have been presented and uh, the knowledge that they have brought to us concerning the requirements of the FTA, uh, current and future ones, which we have to be careful with and how we're going to approach those has been valuable to me in, in understanding of, of, uh, of what, it, what is required to meet those standards. And then also the detail that they've brought in the presentations that I've seen, I thought that was, was very informative. And the questions that I've asked concerning uh, this, the audit process and some of the detailed information. So uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's a good position for, for Mara to have them to serve us. Thank you. Any additional comments, questions, Mr. Floyd? Yeah, I'll just uh, Bree, I'm, I'm in support of this too, Neil. And I, I think the key thing here is probably the hours and the rate per hour. And I think there's two things that strike me in this report. One is that we've been using this firm for a while and, it, and there's a certain amount of benefit to the agency from continuing that relationship. <clears throat> and Malden and Jenkins, is, they do a lot of municipal work, and they do a good job at municipal work. I think the hours they put into this showed a lack of understanding of what was required here and what was needed here. And I think if they tried to do this audit with that number of hours, Marta would end up getting 
the worst end of the deal. So I think you all made a good choice in looking at the hours and, and rating that. So uh, I commend you for your decision and I support it. Thank you. Thank you. And Emil, am I right? When we were here three years ago, we changed. We had a different audit firm. Correct. And so this was the first time that they, the first three years that they have actually been here. Prior to that, it was a different firm. That is correct. The previous firm okay. was Cherry Beckert. That's what I thought. Any additional comments? Okay, we'll call the vote. <coughs> and it is approved. So while you're up there, why don't you give us an update on the internal audit activity? Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's move to the next slide. The internal audit activity briefing covers Mars second fiscal quarter from October 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021. When we meet in May again, I will provide you with a briefing of Marta's third fiscal quarter from January 1st to March 31st uh, of uh, 2022. So the information is just a tiny little bit dated, but uh, given the cadence, uh, um, we'll have to do it this way. During that uh, period, uh, that quarter, uh, the operational audit group completed two operational audit engagements. The first one was a review of the contingency uh, uh, review and, and reporting process. This was a fairly clean audit, uh, so I won't spend too much time on it. The second uh, audit which was performed was on our non-revenue vehicle usage. These are the various different automobiles that uh, are being driven that have the model logo on it. Uh, this audit was rated as high risk and five significant findings were identified. Those five significant findings are in the areas of standard operating procedures which need to be formalized, documented and approved. Oversight of the car mini pool program, the record keeping of permanently assigned and take home vehicles the reservation process of those mini pool vehicles, and finally, the recommendations of an investigation report we did in 2018 were not implemented, which is not a good thing. So overall, um, management has agreed to uh, take significant steps to strengthen the control environment over this uh, process. The date that you see in parentheses are various different due dates, which we will monitor to make sure that those remedial action items are complete. And if they're not, we'll highlight those in yellow as we normally do. Next slide, please. We carry a few audits from prior years where there's still action items to be completed. The first one is the Capital Improve Improvement Program follow-up. We extended the due date to uh, April 1st, 22, in conversations with the Office of, uh, of capital improvement, uh, the CIP office. They're still working on a number of policy and procedures and SOPs. They are working on it. I'm, I'm confident and, and somewhat satisfied that actions are being taken, but they haven't crossed the finish line, which we have to see the finish line cross before we can take it off the list here. So progress is being made, which is why I agreed to extend the due date. But as I said, in the world of internal auditing, there's a little bit of a black and whiteness in the process. And my job is to make sure that the finish line is crossed. So when that happens, and when we review what has been done, we'll take this uh, off the list. The next audit is uh, an office of bus maintenance. There was one action item left. There were a number of that were closed, but one action item left related to predictive maintenance. And we're confident that uh, this will be complete by the beginning of April. So overall, a lot of actions were taken off the list, but there's still some that we're continuing to monitor. Next slide, please. I might spend a little bit more time in the area of the information technology. As the board remembers, uh, when I presented the audit plan in May of last year for our IT audit space, uh, I disclosed to the board that our audit plan has a very, very strongly pronounced cybersecurity component to it. Uh, the world has changed since then, and it has not changed for the better. It has changed for the worse. 
I won't go into the details because we have Mr. Malice who will provide a more in-depth briefing to the audit committee on cybersecurity. But I feel compelled and I feel absolutely convinced that the audit department of MARTA needs to play everything that we need to play and we are capable of playing to ensure or to help the organization ensure that we have adequate um, and robust cybersecurity defenses. The way we do that is by double checking that what IT and cybersecurity do or they're supposed to do, they're actually doing it. And we check various different high-risk areas in the authority and we go deep down into the bowels of how, and uh, forgive me, I'll use a figurative speech here, how the sausage is made. Because sometimes the sausage can look really nice on the surface, but when you taste it, it doesn't taste all that good. And something's missing in the recipe. And I believe that the job of every audit department is to make sure that they test the sausage and they go into the factory and see how the sausage is made and that all the ingredients are in there. Uh, because otherwise some bad things might happen. We live at a time where there's a lot of high risk in the, in the environment. There's a lot of high risk across the globe. And uh, that's why we're spending a lot of time, even though we're a little bit short staff on the IT audit space, uh, we lost some resources, but we, we're continuing to march. So my manager, Victor Alade, he's double, double, you know, doing double duty. He's the manager and he's also auditing at the same time uh, along with the other IT auditor. We kicked off two audits in the quarter. One is a follow-up on a previously done pen test of our tra train control system. We want to see if the remedial action of the pen, uh, pen test of the train control system uh, have been completed. The other engagement is a follow-up engagement on the remedial actions of the enterprise pen testing that was also done a couple of years ago. And we want to make sure that when, when we do pen tests that, that the things are being fixed. So we'll examine that. We finished two uh, engagements in the quarter. One was an advisory engagement related to our cybersecurity insurance. And we made five recommendations uh, to the management team as it relates to that process. The second audit was around our password management. We rated this audit as high risk and we identified three significant findings in that audit and uh, um, I described these findings at a fairly high level because we're broadcasting this meeting on YouTube. And obviously, I don't want to go into a level of technical details of what was not working because <laughs> we don't want to give bullets to the adversary to shoot at us. But uh, we've received commitment of fixing those issues as it relates to password. The reason we chose to audit passwords is because compromised passwords is one of the primary vectors for an adversary to enter into the environment. So um, we'll monitor and report on the remediation of, uh, of the fixes of those findings. Next slide, please. Um, we do carry uh, some findings from prior audits as well. Uh, the good news is on the patch management audit, all the significant findings were complete and there's only one uh, lesser finding that's still uh, in the process of being remediated. The next audit on the second line is the SCADA and train control system cybersecurity audit, which we completed in uh, 2020. There's still some items that are in the process of being completed. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to George Wright, who sits over there, who has continuously been providing updates proactively to the Department of Internal Audit as it relates to the remedial actions here. Now, in reality, all of these remedial actions depend on Alstom completing the project. As most of the board members know, Alstom is the, the company that is actually implementing the new train control system and the upgrade to the SCADA. So these action items are contingent uh, on Alstom completing the project. We think that they'll be able to meet these deadlines. Um, so we'll continue to monitor and report to the board as it relates to, uh, to the completion of the remaining two items out of the total of six, as you can see, that they're still open. Uh, High-risk area, 
we're dealing with an area of cyber, cyber physical risk uh, and we'll need to watch it very, very carefully. The last audit has to do with uh, managing some outdated assets in the MARTA environment. I know Kirk's been trying to get rid of them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, this process will be completed sooner rather than later because we do not want to have outdated operating systems in the MARTA environment. Uh, and I speak, <laughs> I can say that confidently. Um, so a lot of work in the cybersecurity space, uh, but as I said, we'll do what we can from an audit perspective to help the authority. Next slide, please. The contract audit group uh, received 25 audit requests, completed 25 audits in the quarter, quite a bit. Uh, they identified about $6,000 worth of savings, which I think is a good thing because most of the proposals come with uh, the right overhead rates and we supported labor rates so we don't have to write exception reports. So that's a good thing. Uh, at the end of the quarter, we had 18 audits in, prog uh, in progress. As a reminder, this is, this is a pipeline. We, we turn them around as we get them. So we continuously get new audit requests and we turn them around uh, and we issue the audit reports. Next slide, please. The uh, fraud, waste, and abuse hotline received three reports. One allegation was investigated and was found to be unsubstantiated. One uh, call was referred to management. Management investigated it, and the employee that was involved was disciplined. And then the third call uh, was also referred to management because it had to do with time cards and these sort of things. Uh, and management uh, uh, is uh, investigating it. I will be following up with management to make sure that the right level of investigation has taken place and that um, we can close this in an appropriate sort of way. Now, during this audit committee meeting, next slide, please. I'd like to stay a little bit more on the fraud hotline uh, just to give the board and the audit committee an update of some of the changes that we're uh, making in the process. Approximately four years ago, um, the department embarked on a digital transformation journey to move, a, move us away from our dependencies on paper and pencil, so to speak, and move us into the digital age. The first th things that we did about three years ago was to implement a cloud-based audit technology for our core audit processes. All of our audits are in the cloud. The entire process, including updates, including when George and his people have to provide updates to us or, for example, the SCADA. They go into that cloud system and they update it there. Everything's digital, everything is in the cloud. The great thing about this is that when COVID hit, we didn't skip a beat. We did not reduce our audit plan. Yeah, everything's there, everything is accessible. You can access it, including on your phone. So uh, extremely good for us in terms of business continuity management, in terms of efficiency, in terms of productivity. The time came for us to transform digitally our hot fraud line. And uh, for you to receive the details, I'd like to invite Mr. Charles Middlebrooks, who is the acting director of operations, audit, and fraud investigations to come and give you just a little bit more detail about how we kind of completed that transformation journey, which happened during the same quarter. So, Charles. Thank you, Emil. Good morning, Audit Committee Chairman Hartage. Good morning, board members. Good morning, Mr. Greenwood and good morning to MARTA executive staff. My name is Charles Middlebrooks. I'm the Acting Director of Operations Audit and Fraud Investigations. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing me to come before you and provide a brief overview of the digital transformation of our fraud hotline process. Next slide. When I assumed the role of managing the fraud hotline, the technology that we were using was fairly basic. A person who wanted to report an allegation uh, of fraud would have to call the hotline and leave a voicemail message. There was no automated audit trail or receipt or disposition of complaints. We had no ability to anonymously communicate with a caller. 
the caller always had to leave a voicemail without speaking to a live person. The technology that we used did not allow for the uh, did not allow for an email or web-based communication or interface. And the business continuity of the fraud hotline was limited. With the technology limitation, some challenges existed, such as investigations being conducted often with, with limited information leading to inefficient use of internal audit resources and limited outcomes. The, the inability to ask follow-up questions, business continuity risks, and limited options to submit anonymous complaints. To enhance our fraud hotline technology and to incorporate gold standard techniques into our audit process, we researched several companies that provided uh, this type of service. And in doing so, we selected the following. Next slide. We selected Lighthouse Software. Lighthouse Software is a web-based case management system that tracks, addresses, and monitors all incident reporting activities. Lighthouse Services is a third-party hotline service provider which offers the following. Anonymous hotline reporting, automated fraud investigations, and provides an audit trail to provide clear evidence of investigative activity. The case management system went live in October of 2021. It should be noted that several companies and organizations use Lighthouse software services. Just to name a few, AAA, the PGA, University of Arizona, Dallas Area Rapid Transit, and Utah Transit Authority. Next slide. Some of Lighthouse's key features are as follows. Calls can be answered, are answered by professionally trained operators, and those calls are answered 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. Complaints now can be sent via email, phone, or received through the Lighthouse web portal. Another key feature is the ability to maintain uh, the confidenti uh, confidentiality of the reporter when they make an allegation. Another key feature is that an open exchange between the reporter and Lighthouse operator and MARTA investigators currently exists. And the last key feature is the ability to, to legitimize the fraud, waste, and abuse allegations. This is a very key feature because it allows the MARTA investigator to quickly assess what has been provided and determine whether an investigation should be open or not it also allows the MARTA investigator to be able to determine, excuse me, to be able to determine um, whether information should be provided to MARTA management for their review and resolution. Next slide. To bring about more awareness uh, related to fraud and the fraud, new fraud hotline, we also created an e-course, which was distributed agency-wide through our learning and development department. The purpose of the course was to be able to minimize the potential for fraud occurring at MARTA. We had three main, uh, main objectives. Those objectives were to be able to teach management and staff how to identify and to de define fraud, to identify fraudulent behaviors, and to also help management and staff understand how to report fraud. This course is now an on-demand course, and it allows for MARTA staff to be able to go out and um, review the course at their leisure. And finally, through this process, we were able to reduce new employee training orientation time. At this time, this concludes my presentation, and I'll yield it back to you, Neil. Neil? Thank you both. Those were, that was a lot of information to cover, and I appreciate it. Do we have any comments or questions for anyone? Mr. Snyder. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. I had one question about um, password management audit. Um, just going back to that, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very detailed. Um, but I wanted to ask, do we use two-step um, authentication or anything like that sort of uh, kind of 
dynamic ways? Yes, we do have two-factor authentication in the authority. Um, it's a great question, and I think it's a great tool in the tool chest uh, of the authority. Um, so in addition to the password, there's a two-factor authentication, which I know how it works, but I won't describe it, and we can take it sure. in the back. <laughs> but, but as I say to my friends uh, you know, around the authority, we have two-factor authentication, which means the first factor has to work well, which is the password, mm -hmm. and the second factor, which is a, the second factor of the, but, but we do. Gotcha. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Scott? Yes. In regards to the, um, I believe it's the slide number eight, the last bullet point, three employees were out on medical leave, but were being allowed by their One support. more. One more back. Um, pardon me? Number seven. Slide number seven. Number seven. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the number underneath. And my question was, is that this report was through December 31st, and we we're almost near the end of March. Do we have any update in nearly a three-month interval, or uh, are we still not sure if this is, was actually uh, complete, if fraud was actually completed? A lot of reviews have been done and the people that were involved have been identified. The investigation has not, be conclu has not concluded completely, so to speak. Um, I'll be able to report on this in May. Um, so, so without compromising the process, I would say that a lot of work has already been done. We know who's been involved and what the circumstances are but we have not formally reached the conclusion point. Um, Thank you. I, I don't know if that satisfies you, and I understand I'm kind of dancing a little bit around it, just given the sensitivity. I'm, no, I'm I a little hesitant. I was just concerned about the timeline, more mm -hmm. the timeline, uh, the fact that the process and what we're saying would allow us to address issues in a more timely manner. And so looking at near, a near three month interval, I, that was my question. But I also understand that you should not discuss details. So thank you for the answer. And I appreciate the comment, thank you. Any other comments? Thank you very much. We now have a cybersecurity update from Dean Malice. Welcome, Mr. Malice. Good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Greenwood, members of the Audit Committee and the Board. Thank you, Emil. Um, I really appreciate Emil's team, I have to say that, because they are well versed in cyber, which makes his audits much more effective because they understand what we do. So I really appreciate his team. Emil and I meet almost weekly to discuss cyber issues. Um, so thank you, Emil. On March 21st, President Biden issued a statement pertaining to cybersecurity that said in part, and pardon me, but I'm going to read it because I think it's important. This is a critical moment to accelerate our work to improve domestic cybersecurity and bolster our national resilience. I have previously warned about the potential that Russia could conduct malicious cyber attack activity against the United States, including as a response to the unprecedented economic costs we've imposed on Russia alongside our allies and partners. It's part of Russia's playbook. Today, my administration is reiterating those warnings based on evolving intelligence that the Russian government is exploring options for potential cyber attacks. He ended with this, if you have not already done so, I urge our private sector partners to harden your cybersecurity defenses immediately by implementing the best practices we have developed together over the last year. You have the power, the capacity, and the responsibility to strengthen the cybersecurity and resilience of the critical services and technology, technologies on which Americans rely. We need everyone to do their part to meet one of the defining threats of our time. Your vigilance and urgency today can prevent or mitigate attacks tomorrow. I mention this because it's not often that the President of the United States issues a statement like this. And it highlights that everything we are doing from a cyber perspective is important 
and the following updates that I'm going to give illustrate some of the items we're implementing to help reduce some of the risks we have. But as I've said previously to this board and the whole board and the committees, hackers only need to be right once. There are daily updates from the TSA, the FBI, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency, and the Department of Homeland Securities that I get. And I'm working with Kirk and my RT partners to ensure that we have resiliency in case we suffer a cyber attack. We still have a lot of work to do, but we keep moving it forward, trying to reduce the risk. So let's start. Next slide, please. In December, TSA issued a cybersecurity directive that we are, re that we are bound to. It's for transit and, and rail operators. And there were four points in that directive. We need to designate a cybersecurity coordinator, report cyber incidents to CISA, and that CISA is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency within 24 hours, develop and implement a cybersecurity incident response plan to reduce the risk of an operational disruption, and complete a cybersecurity vulnerability assessment to identify potential gaps or vulnerabilities in our system. That came out in December. The designated cybersecurity coordinators are myself and Antoine Banks. There are some requirements around that. The requirements are that you have to be a, a full-time employee, you have to be a U.S. citizen, you have to either have secret clearance or be eligible for secret, secret clearance, and we meet those requirements. The second bullet is self-explanatory. We have to report uh, uh, incidents within 24 hours. Um, we have a cybersecurity incident response plan. We've had one. We are doing a tabletop exercise to kind of stress test that on May 6th. Um, that has to be sent to uh, CISA as well and the TSA, which we will as soon as we kind of clean up some of it. And we have completed the cybersecurity vulnerability assessment. It's a self-assessment. A lot of it is uh, wrapped around the train control side of the house and working with George's team. We, we filled that out. I'm sure we'll get questions back from the uh, TSA. That was due uh, March 31st. We submitted it last week, so we're, we're on time. Um, so there, the other component of that, at some point, TSA will do site, as, site assessments. They already started that with uh, pipe, um, pipelines. So that, that will be coming, I would imagine, near future. I would think MARTA would be a little bit down because it probably hit MTA and, and WMATA first. So that will be coming. Next slide, please. So a couple of the things that we, we are doing. Uh, last week, I came to the board for approval for 24 by 7 monitoring and vulnerability scanning, uh, having a third-party vendor do that. You approved it. We're working through finalizing the contract and getting that implemented. The vendor will monitor our network 24 by 7, so they'll look at all of our security logs, and we've got, we'll have a, a, a escalation tree. They'll uh, alert us 24 by 7, so some of us will be woken up in the middle of the night, which is fine. They'll be doing our vulnerability scanning, so I've outsourced that as well because it's staffing is, is talent pool is thin. Trying to get staffing is hard. It offsets some of that responsibility over to the vendor, and they'll continually do that vulnerability scanning and provide us good reports and know where we need to focus. We save money on an, a full-time employee. I'm also able to retire, as I mentioned to the board, several technologies that are, save us 327,000 from the operating budget on a yearly, for the year of the contract. So it's every year $327,000, and we're paying that with grant funds. So I actively pursue uh, cyber grants, and since I've been here, we've acquired about $4 million, and we've been spending that. The other thing that we're doing is we're still doing our ad advanced endpoint protection. Some of the networks that we have, and like CCTV and the automatic fare connect, uh, collection network, they're contained networks, so it's a little technology manipulation that we have to do to get that endpoint to work, but we're consistently uh, moving that forward to try and get that out to every endpoint because that's, that's a big vector of attack. We implemented a malicious domain blocking. It was a free service from the Department of Homeland Security. We upgraded to the paid service. It was about $50,000. It gives us a little bit more granularity in what we're doing. It uh, enforces security for roaming users, so we've all been doing remote a lot, so this will help on the remote side because we lost that visibility when people left and went, went to their homes and working. The other thing that it's going to do is a lot of the malware comes through securely. You know, they encrypt it and you can't read it. This will decrypt that traffic, be able to look at the stuff that's going out of the network to see if they're moving data, if there are any malwares coming in. 
The next thing that we're doing is we're doing two penetration tests. When the new trains come, we're going to be penetration, penetration testing those, but we're also doing a design review to make sure that Stadler provides a robust system to MARTA. Along with that penetration test, we're also going to be looking at our, at our infrastructure now that we currently have, so the communication from the trains to the, to the platforms and the waysides and things like that to make sure those are secure. Uh, Kirk and I are, are on the same page in terms of what we want the internal network on those trains to look like. Uh, having the penetration test and the de design review will reinforce that. We're also going to be looking at uh, enterprise applications in our cloud. So over the years, back in the day, cyber folks didn't like the cloud. Well, businesses like the cloud because it's easy and we have to adjust. So we've moved a lot of things up to the cloud. And one of the things that we're going to do from a penetration testing uh, perspective is test our in cloud instances to make sure those are secure. And that really concludes my update right now. Thank you. Do we have any comments or questions for Mr. Mills? Yes, Mr. Floyd. Well, a uh, couple of things. Thank you, Dean. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that it taken me a long time at MARTA to understand, and, and I think we all realize that our job one here is to keep the trains and the buses running. That's what we do first. I don't know that that's the most important thing now. Uh, and it's taken me a long time because we spend a lot of money on audits, uh, external audits, as we've seen this morning awarding this contract, and internal audits. I don't know that I've ever taken the time to go into the budget and see how much time and money we spend on internal audits. But I don't think that there's anything that we do here as an agency that's more important than these audits. I think. From a standpoint of my, my on this board feeling confidence in the information that's being presented to us financially as well as otherwise is more important than that. And I want to thank Emil for your work and Dean for all the stuff that you all are doing to make sure that we feel confident because as a board member, I feel, I feel that confidence, but the public has to feel it also. And they have to know that something's not going on down here that shouldn't be going on, that the finances are in order. And I think that's important. Now, I have sat on the audit committee since I've been on this board. And I will tell you that honestly, I learned early on when I was assigned to boards and stuff that the way you punish people was you put them on the audit committee. <laughs> you didn't like what they were doing. So I felt that from the start here, but it has been very informative to me. I am, uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased in the work that you all are doing. And this cybersecurity stuff scares me to death. And it scares me because I don't know anything about it. I mean, you know, I was at a meeting yesterday, a guy sent me a text, and somebody asked me, can you forward that text to me? And I had to say, no, I don't have any idea how to do that. You can write this down if you want to, but I can't forward <laughs> that to you. So this kind of stuff scares me to death because, and when we get into a lull like we're in right now, it's almost even worse because you think something's about to happen. But the, paying attention to this and what you all do on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and I passed Dean in the parking lot the other day and I thought, oh crap, he's fixed to tell me something's gone wrong or something. But in any event, thank you guys for what you do, Emil, both of you, for what you do, and, and Kirk in the, you know, in the IT part, because it, it is vital to what we do. And, and, and in an agency where keeping the buses and trains running, but also keeping the federal government satisfied, keeping mm -hmm. 22 local governments satisfied, you know, who think when they call down here to college, they think he ought to drop whatever he's <clears> doing and talk to them and satisfy their requirements. It's just a, there's a tremendous amount of work that's going on here in this agency that we don't really think about a lot. But anyway, it, I appreciate what you've done this morning. I, and I know this is something I probably spent a little more time talking about this right now than I should have, but I don't, I have not said this before, but I really do appreciate the effort and the time that's going into this. And I think you all are doing a very commendable job. I, I appreciate that. And, and I had said it last, my job is easier because of the support I had from Mr. Parker and from, from Kali and, and the C team. It, it makes it easier. We still have a lot of challenges. Um, there's still a lot of work that we have, you know, I don't want the board to think that we're 
Uh, everything's peachy you keen. Know, there's there's a lot that has to be done, and, and they're coming up with new attacks every day. But but I, I appreciate those comments. And and like I said, Emil's team has been just awesome. When I stepped in the door, I told Emil, audit me cons constantly, because it keeps what we're doing honest. It makes sure that we're doing the things that we say we're doing. So thank you, Mr. Mullis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chairwoman. Um, first of all, thank you for your service. At a time like this, um, I think the um, language is short, shields up, is from what I understand yes. uh, from TSA. Um, uh, you mentioned that you're doing outsourcing, and I can understand the immediate need to get the shields up on outsourcing. Uh, do we have a medium term to long term? Uh, strategy to bring some of these security um, capabilities in-house because I don't see the threat lessening. I see it increasing uh, at a rapid pace. Um, are we supporting you from a budgetary standpoint to bring that capacity in-house? Yes, um, you are. We've There are a few things that make sense to outsource and there's other things that don't make sense to outsource. Um, the biggest issue right now is recruiting and getting the talent in and we're trying to be creative um, in, in that aspect these the salaries that cybersecurity folks are commanding out there are are incredible and while the salaries that HR poses are really great salaries for 90 percent of Americans from cyber folks they're not so we're, we're trying to get creative my counterpart at, at one of the private sectors they're actually going nationwide and they're just letting people work remote so you know I'm working with HR to kind of be creative in that aspect uh, but like I said there's certain things the 24 by 7 monitoring makes sense if we brought that in-house research I've done you need about 16 people to monitor those screens 24 by 7 uh, you've got vacation time you got attrition you've got training so that part makes sense the vulnerability scanning part takes a good chunk of uh, a person's time and and we felt the and I mentioned it one one during my procurement unfortunately one of my staff members had passed away and his function was, was the vulnerability scan so we had to kind of shuffle that off to other uh, an already kind of tax team so yeah there's things that we're, we're bringing in-house and there's the the I've gotten the support from uh, C team in terms of, of staffing because they, they realize the importance of that. But again, I don't. I, I could ask for all these recs. It's just a matter of trying to get those people in. So. Thank you. Any more, oh, Mr. Frierson? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I had a question concerning um, the retirement of several of the technologies that you're talking about. I, I know that um, you know Marta has always been on the forefront of dealing with embracing new technologies, and, and that's important in, in keeping the update currently. Uh, and and I, I think of the challenges that other industries are facing because they have legacy softwares that they are not changing, and they're very vulnerable in those spaces. Uh, and they find it very difficult to implement these new security controls that you have. But the ones that you are retiring, what was the reason for the purpose of retiring those? It's, it's redundancy, So, and I, and I can kind of go into it. Um, and I, a lot of times I keep these a little bit high level. As Emil said, I don't like to give, right. give okay. those that ammunition. But um, so the, the 24 by 7 monitoring, they've, they've got their own log aggregator. So I'm retiring the old one. Okay. The vulnerability scanning, they have their own. So we're retiring that. There's some other uh, endpoint stuff that they're doing, that, and we're going to retire those out. And I'm thinking through the top of my head. There's some network monitoring things that we're going to retire, kind of consolidating it into that one okay. um, and removing that redundancy, really. We do have a lot of, uh, as Emil said, there's a lot of legacy stuff here, and, and we're, we're working to, to kind of remove those with Kirk's team. But a lot of that is, is procurement times and implementation times mm -hmm. and, and staffing uh, um, workload, too. Okay. But, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Mr. Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was very, very helpful. I, I have a question about the uh, cybersecurity incident report response plan. No, you can't tell me the details of that, so I'm not going to ask for that. I can give but, a high level, but go ahead. <laughs> but really, my question goes to we're getting all these new trains, um, fancy new trains, uh, new technology in those trains. Will we have to adjust? 
this cybersecurity incident response plan to adapt to the new technology of our new trains, one, and then two, is there a way to manually operate a train? If, if our entire network goes down or is taken over by a hacker, can we manually operate? Let me answer your first one. I'm going to defer that to George. Um, My brain just, what was your first one? Yeah, about the new train. <laughs> thank and you, the thank you. Yeah, so the incident response plan, it, it's a, you've got two parts to it. You've got the, the there's a policy, then we're going to have an incident response plan. You've got the plan, which is a generic kind of high level. These are the people that need to be pulled together. This is kind of, you know, who's got to be called. We've got media, we've got legal. And then you've got the playbooks. So the playbooks will change depend on, depending on the technology and depending on what the attacks might be out there. So we've got a fairly detailed one around ransomware stuff because that's, that's big. Um, and as when the new trains come in, there might be a little bit different things that we have to tweak on how we're going to react to an incident that would happen on that. My understanding on the train, I'm going to have George, um, there is a manual function, but I'd be talking way out of my, my, my wheelhouse. Good morning. Hey, how you doing? Yes, we do have processes. We certainly would not uh, want to be in that particular situation, but we do, in fact, have processes and procedures that will allow us to run manually. That said, you know, you, you, we would be talking about significant delays and different things like that. Uh, right. it, uh, occasionally, not because we've been attacked. There, are, there are occasions where we have to deploy those type of processes, and and we, we would certainly see delays and different things like that if that were to. Thank you, guys. Any other comments, Ms. Scott? Madam Chair, my light has been on. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't see it. <laughs> I know. It's very difficult with the mirrors here. Uh, part of my question was asked by Mr. Fryston regarding the um, retiring technology. Uh, I understand, and you did answer that, it, the several aspects of the new technology incorporates the old technology. Is that correct? Yes. In regards to our police, the MARTA police and security, are we, do we still have the ability for the MARTA police in, to also work along with the, say, Atlanta police or each jurisdictional police in case there is a problem with um, the technology that we use for uh, talking to each other. He's coming. Communication technology. I believe that if there is an aspect of a security violation that the police have a way to talk to each other separate from where Mr. Floyd and I may talk to each other on our cell phones, seeing if he could send me a message, you know, or what. <laughs> but is that correct? Yes, Chair Scott. Um, there's a couple of things. One, the cell phone uh, through uh, AT&T's uh, FirstNet uh, for cell phone service that's provided directly to law enforcement through satellites. And then we have our communication radios uh, that are the, the backup of that, uh, that we can communicate with all our jurisdictions in the region. And then we also have what's called UASI, which is the Urban Area Security Initiative, which is a federal uh, grant opportunity for all these uh, jurisdictions to work together. And we have what's called a UASI channel um, that all jurisdictions in our area can go over to and talk to one each, to each other. And this can be done if there is a problem with the normal service, no matter what, there is a separate Correct. service for our... our if the repeaters go down, uh, if the towers go down, um, if the cell phone towers go down, uh, it goes over to a, a different frequency and a different manner of how that's communicated. And I won't go into that publicly with you, but we can Thank talk you. about offline if you'd like. Thank you. Sure. I'm looking. Uh, Mr. Pond. Hi. Uh, thanks, Dean, uh, for your report. You guys are doing a great job. Uh, I know you can't go into detail, and uh, it would be informative, I would just like to get a sense when you monitor for people trying to penetrate our systems, uh, how frequent that is, because you guys uh, were able to uh, see when you're trying to be in, uh, 
tag like that. I'm just kind of curious. So uh, one time a week, one time a month, 50 times a month. I'm just trying to get a sense to show I, how important this is. I can get you numbers, but I don't, it, I don't it, need but, but but it's it's daily, um, and you know we've been working over the past years to kind of shore up that monitoring perspective so we could see because if we don't can't see it we don't know that we're being you know targeted but it is it is daily and it's it's hourly that we will get scans again across the network uh, we get a lot of uh, we're fortunate in the product that we use for our spam filtering and, and to call it a spam filter is, is does it a disservice um, those attacks are in in terms of the email levels are thousands of, of, of those and then just even when I talk about the malicious domain blocking that runs all of our traffic our outbound traffic to a service and and what that blocks is in the 30 to 40 or 50 thousand a, a month I'm not sorry a week in terms of those things that are, are, are getting blocked so that people don't hit those those sites but yeah it's and, it, and it's gotten worse you know as as, as the geopolitical stuff increases the, the cyber wars, and Antoine's not here, but he did military for 25 years, and the, and the first thing that they did was go in cyber. Before they even put troops on the ground, the cyber attacks escalated. I believe there was a Russian meatpacking plant that just got, got hacked. You know, the, it, it's constant, and it's just gotten worse. And I think I had mentioned every day I'm getting two or three updates on this new vulnerability, this new attack vector, this new cyber uh, organization that's attacking so yeah it, it's a lot yeah that's I knew it was gray hair I knew it was significant I just think it's important we all realize how important it is that we provide the resources you need to uh, do the right kind of things so. yeah as I as I said it's a lot of times it's 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 moving procurements implementation and staffing is is, is the slow the, the the budgetary right now is is good and the staffing allocation is good it's just getting those resources and then like I said getting through procurement and getting it out and, and working with Kirk's team because they, they're taxed too in terms of getting these things out there um, but like I said it's all it takes is one so that's why I want to focus on resiliency getting us getting us back anyone else Any additional comments? Thank you both for Just all. One, one oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Scott. Okay. Madam Chair, for you actually, was there any um, specific coverage at the AFTA conference regarding cybersecurity? There was a small briefing on cybersecurity, um, and it actually occurred at the same time that we were at with um, some of our meetings, and so I was not at that actual briefing that they, but um, so I, I'm sure we can watch it. It's probably online, but we were actually meeting with, um, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember. We did, we were not there at the time, but thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Just say thank you again for all you've done. This has been a great presentation and obviously a big of interest to our board, so. Thank you very much for everybody that participated. Thank you. And the audit committee is adjourned. <laughs>